That thermal uh, sleeping bag. Yeah. You gotta figure out okay, what, what am I carrying? How much weight do I want to carry versus how cold do I want to be? Yeah. And you also have some squats with other people. Yep. Yep. So they, they, the they do have, yeah. yep, they, they were gonna have like, <laughs> yep, overnight watches and who's gonna be doing what. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Like they're making this very. Testing one, two, one, two, testing one, two. Do we have a Hear, O people, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your might. I greet you in the name of the triune God of grace, and I welcome you here to his house this morning. Few things, few announcements. First of all, um, 
Next Sunday, April 14th, from 1 to 3, there is a food collection that um, we've been given three hours to do, okay, um, down at Stop and Shop. So we need volunteers to be down at Stop and Shop next week. We need you to sign up with Leslie Mosley. She's actually up in the balcony. Most of you, if you're underneath, you can't see her, but she's up there. Um, try to track Leslie down during coffee hour. Um, she's looking for people to take half hour slots to be able to have a cart right by the doors as people exit they can or as they're heading in they know to buy something to be able to add for the food pantry so that is next week um, next Sunday afternoon from 1 to 3 if you are interested in membership if you notice there is now an announcement that's actually adding dates um, we're looking to gather at the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday mornings uh, starting the 28th. It'll be the 28th of April, May 5th, and then May 12th. And then at one point, um, if you've decided that you want to become a member of this church family, we will um, arrange for you to meet um, our wacky elders so that they get a chance to know you, but you also get a chance to know them. So please let us know, because I need to know which room I'm going to do this in. If it's a smaller group, we're in my office. If it's a bigger group, we've got to be down in the parlor. So I need to know, so please contact D this week in the office so that we have an idea of how to schedule this. Let's see, it's Communion Sunday, and every once in a while I uh, like to throw in the fact that on Communion Sundays we remember that we have deacons, and our deacons do benevolent work. Um, so you can grab a blank envelope in, um, in the pews, and you can add, throw, throw a few bucks in, uh, mark it deacons. If you want to write a check, put deacons in the memo, and that will go into the deacons' funds when they are reaching out to people who are in need in the congregation. Coffee time. First of all, big, big, big giant thank you for those who put out that spread last Sunday. That was a spread. Um, so, but the thing is, is that um, we cannot rely on the same people every week. It's not fair. You know, they have done it diligently over the last four years. We've had PW step up, and they will, you know, they will occasionally sponsor as well and put together. We need teams. So you need to um, get a hold of the membership council, Jennifer Harmson or Bruce Schaefer. Let them know that, you're willing, that you formed a team. You need probably, what, I guess about six to eight people, right, John? So about six to eight people. Um, please consider this uh, because it is, it's time. It's time for all of us to re-engage um, and no longer um, guard our time is what the young people call it now. We, st we have to stop guarding our time. And we need to start carving out some time um, for service. Let's see, what else? I guess that is pretty much it other than, oh, Life After Him is canceled this week. Um, you know, uh, the, the lady who put that all together, Gail, has had some health problems. But, you know, it's been kind of, it's also one of those icky seasons where everybody's got this, some sort of icky thing going on in their sinuses. So just kind of pay attention to that. Tuesday night, spaghetti dinner that supports um, Mana House. Uh, Manor House, the ministry that um, a lot of churches in the area participate in up at Newton Presbyterian Church. Oh, PW's having a luncheon this week. Let's not forget that. Um, you know, and you're always welcome to bring food. It's like a covered dish lunch. Um, you know, I'm going to miss it this week because I'm off, but that's okay. And the men's breakfast is coming up Saturday the 13th. Last but not least, I have... Who's speaking on, who's, who's doing the Minute for Mission from Text Council? Isn't that today? Is it next week? Oh, good. <laughs> then I gave myself the wrong note. Joe, make a note that next week when you preach, the Tech Council, which for which you're the chair, is supposed to do a Minute for Mission. You got it? So you'll already be up here to preach. Okay, I got it now. I got it now. I need a vacation. Let's come before God as we open this worship by hearing Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, 
running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Let us worship God. It's almost like children. I'm not going to be quiet, but I'm going to run around. <laughs> On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me. Even so, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the marks of the nails and the place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name.
Oh, Lord, there's an anthem. It is well. It is well with our souls. Sometimes we struggle because we think it's not well. And yet, that triumphant words, even when we're struggling, even when we're anxious, even when we're sick, even when we're mourning, it is well with our soul. Even as we ponder the cross and the empty tomb and all that means coming through the Easter season and as much as some people have faded away, here we are because we are here to sing, it is well with my soul. In life's celebrations, in births and in death, we can say, it is well with my soul. Help us to experience you, Lord. In this place, this place that is not a building, this place that is a collective heart, help us to experience you in the center of who we are. For you created us, you saved us, and now you inspire us. Lord, hear us as we join our voices and our hearts together collectively with the words you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, ponder what it means to be filled with the peace of Jesus Christ and know that it is well with your soul.
produce of our lives that come in in this plate, that come in through the internet, that come in through the mail. We offer it all up to you. Help us, Lord. Help us to do the ministry you have sent us in the world to do. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Master, our Savior, and our friend that we pray. Amen. All right, come on up. Where are you? Cameron wants to stop and socialize. child has a smile on his face all the time. How is that possible? <laughs> smiling eyes, smiling face. And here comes the box. Look at this. He's up on her, her thigh and he's looking over like, hey, look at me, look at me. I was like you once. I'm like you still. Hi! Hi! That's pretty impressive. I like that. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. It is 12 pairs of hypoallergenic earrings. <laughs> I could tell you that there was a point in my life where I actually contemplated getting my ears pierced, but I won't do that. Ears. Ears. Our ears are just as valuable as our eyes and our noses because they all lead, interestingly enough, to the heart. Yeah, even smells. You can smell something bad and your heart will tell you, mm, that's something that doesn't smell right. But ears. Ears are how we hear the world but also how we hear, if we're listening, how we hear God. How we hear God's creation, right? Have you heard, um, have you heard that the frogs are coming out? The spring frogs? Are you taking the time to listen to the frogs at night when the sun goes down and they're making those weird little chirping sounds? Do you hear the birds? Have you heard the geese as they've been flying back from the winter? Did you hear the earthquake the other day? A lot of people don't realize that you can hear an earthquake, not just feel an earthquake. I could hear it as I sat up in my office. Rumble, 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 and it wasn't like Jake Brakes coming down the highway with those big tractor trailers, but I hear those too. Listen. Listen to where God might speak. Maybe he speaks in the crickets and the frogs. Maybe he speaks in the wind. Maybe he speaks in an earthquake. Maybe he's just trying to remind us all, I'm here. 
Do you hear me? I'm here. Hear God with your hearts and your ears. Got it? What do you think, Dan? Did I get away with that one? Okay, thank you. Let's pray. Lord, help us not just to talk at you, but to let you speak and let us hear your voice. Let us hear your voice in the words of Jesus Christ. Let us hear your voice in other faithful people. Let us hear your voice even in people who don't know you, because sometimes you speak through them. Help us to hear, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's children said? Amen. Amen. All right, here's your earrings back. Did you get your ears pierced? Did you get your ears pierced? Are those your earrings then? Uh, I didn't wear them. You didn't? Obviously, the package is unopened. <laughs> Let's see. See his face? He's like, he's trying not to look at me. Like, like maybe if I don't look at Pastor Pat, he'll give me the box. Chase, it worked. Oops! Get out of here. Chase is actually in the preschool. When I go up for the preschool visits, he is one of the most wonderfully animated characters. This animated character knows an animated character. We now find ourselves um, a couple of months down the road from that night where they experienced Jesus. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Pentecost has happened. But the church is still together. This comes from the book of Acts chapter 4. Now the full number of those who believed were one in heart and soul. And no one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. And now we move to many years later. The apostle John is an old man, and he probably has people who he's telling the story to and they're writing it down. In church tradition, it was one of two of his disciples, his closest disciples, either Irenaeus or Polycarp. That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we will pro proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. 
my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It was about 72 hours, three days. On Thursday night, they're eating dinner with him. He's washed their feet. He's given them a new commandment. He's broken bread and given it to them and declared a new covenant. He's poured a cup and given that to them as a new covenant. Flesh and blood, he is doing this on that Thursday night. They had no idea what the next 24 hours were going to bring. Today, we find ourselves in a gospel reading that's about 72 hours out from that night. And we find the disciples in lockdown. Let me say that again. We find the disciples in lockdown. They're not afraid of the Romans. They're not afraid of COVID. They're not afraid of any of that. They're afraid of the residents of Jerusalem because they know what those people did to their Lord. They are locked down because they're afraid. And then he shows up. He shows up and he uses those words. Peace be with you. The word peace in Aramaic and in Hebrew is shalom, which means completeness, wholeness, prosperity. He says shalom. Peace be with you. And here's the other thing. The you, I love the pronoun you. Because the same word can mean singular or plural. And in this case, in the Greek, it is very definitively plural. Peace be with you. In other words, wholeness and unity of you, the body that is before me. Together. And it says, basically, everybody's there. Well, except one. Everybody else is there. And he says, look at my hands. It's me. Look at my side. It's me. There's this, you could just feel this strange, wonderful calmness and fright happening all at the same time. They're in awe. Some of the people in that room watched him die. They watched that spear go into his side. They saw it. They confirmed it. Yes, there's these weird things about an empty tomb now. And here he is. Here he stands. And then he says it. And then he does it. Look at the two things he does. One is, notice that he breathes on them. He breathes on them. He's breathing life into them. Just like God breathed life into Adam, he's breathing life into them. And he says, <sighs> He didn't cough, I did. Oh, allergy season, you gotta love it. But he breathes life into them. And he says, receive my Holy Spirit. And then he says it. Then he says it. As the Father has sent me, <coughs> I send you. As the Father has sent me, I have sent you. Think about the ramifications of those words. Think about it. And they accept it. 
and they are excited. And then Jesus is gone, and Thomas shows up. He's not doubting Thomas, I think. I think he's downer Thomas at this point, but actually I think he is used as an incredible metaphor and an incredible symbol of what it is that we are. Thomas is us. He wasn't there to see the wounds in the hand. He wasn't there to put a hand in the side. And at first he's like, I can't believe this. He's got to be incredulous. Are you kidding me? You're telling me this story? I won't believe it unless I can do it. Unless I can see it. But in a way, if you think about it, for generations to come, they're not going to see those wounds. We're not going to see those wounds. Which is why Jesus breathed on them. It was like a whole new humanity coming to life. And Thomas was representing us. Eight days later, though, they're all still together. At this time, Thomas is with them. They're together. What is it the psalm said? How beautiful it is when brothers live in unity. They're still together. It's amazing. Jesus goes right at Thomas. Come here. Put your fingers in here. Give me your hand. Let's put it in here. Thomas doesn't need that at this point in time. Thomas's declaration is one of my favorite statements in all of Scripture. My Lord and my God. The declaration Thomas is making is that Jesus is not no, is no longer his master. He's also his God. We forget that sometimes. This, this radical Trinitarian absolutely won't give up that ghost. Jesus is God. Thomas said so. John is saying so. The early disciples are saying, this is God in the flesh. And look at what he's done for us. Look at this. The power of community is now about to break out. Pentecost will be a few weeks away for them and for us. But in the meantime, if you notice, they've already received the breath of God, they're alive. Something is happening to them. They have been prepared for at least three years to go out and do this thing. As God has sent me, now I send you. As the Father has sent me, now I send you. Those words should haunt us in a good way, but haunt us. They should be nipping at our heels everywhere we go. As the Father has sent the Son, the Son has sent us. And us, by the way, is plural. We turn now to, though, that gathering. And they're all, it says, they're all of one heart and soul. They're all together. Those are words, when you look at the Greek, those are words that are talking about siblings. There's very much the intimacy of siblings going on there. There is, just like that psalm, how beautiful it is, how joyful it is, how wonderful it is when siblings live together in harmony. And here they are. Now, I, I remember um, early on in ministry, and I had some gruff old farmer who looked at me, and he says, well, looks like that, looks like that communist experiment didn't work. You know what I'm talking about? Because there was a belief, you know, there are people who believe that, you know, in the, in the face of capitalism, what? 
people are, they don't have, they don't leave any claim on their own property. Everybody has something in common. No, actually the words in the Greek ref- reference, they all have something in common like family. And if your brother goes down, what do you do? You take care of him, no matter what the cost. My parents, when they were buying their first house in 1966, they didn't have the money for a deposit. They asked a family member for that money, and they were told no. So my father had to call his brother in Newark, who wired him. Was it Western Union? Is that still around? Sent $500 so they could buy a $17,000 house. My last car cost $23,000. What is wrong with this picture? But family does what family does. My biggest supporter when I was in seminary and as I have been in ministry hasn't been people from the churches I served. It's been my brother. How beautiful it is when family dwells together. He's my friend. He's my confidant. And I am a friend and confidant to him. He's also a knight of Columbus, which I think is just really stinking cool. He's got a sword and everything. But I want you to think about that because that is what is being said. Notice the we language in John's letter. We is plural. He's got two guys with Greek names, Irenaeus and Polycarp. Polycarp, by the way, is my favorite name in all of Christendom. I think it means many fish, not really. But poly is many, but carp, I don't know. My point is, from a breath in an upper room where the doors were locked, we were made human. We were given life. We were animated. And Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, now I send you. In Pittsburgh, it would be yins. Can you imagine Jesus talking in Pittsburgh? Can you imagine what the Bible would be if it, if it was written in Pittsburghese? Now I send yins. Going to come with? We're going to rent up our room. Think about this. I, I throw humor in it, but you know what? It's what makes people in Pittsburgh real distinct. There's a sense of unity because they have their own dialogue, their own dialect. It is really weird. When we got there, we had to learn all that. I want you to think about that because that's very much what we're called to be. John says, under this power, we're out there giving the testimony. Under this power, we are being a faithful presence in the world. John is writing this or dictating this some 50 or 60 years after Jesus has ascended into heaven. It's not even legal to be Christian yet. And yet, here is John sharing these words. This is what it is. It's about us. And it's about the fact that what we share is that on the cross, our sins were forgiven. And we are now alive. Even when we sin, Jesus has got us covered. I'm still trying to figure out the word propitiation. I'm still trying to figure out why somebody would even create such a word. But it means that we have been forgiven. We have been cleansed. It has been paid for. It is there. So what are we going to do about it? The greatest crime of the second half of the 20th century and now into the 21st century is the church does not take that seriously enough. We're not warriors. We're lovers. John would go on and on and on about little children love one another, love one another, love one another. There's a reason for that, because that is the core of the gospel message. That is the new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus said that, by the way. This is what we are called to be. Why aren't we? Well, pastor, I show up at church every Sunday. That's not enough. And yet, I'm not making this simple, because it may be simple words, but it is not a simple thing to do. There's nothing simple about this. Faithful presence is not about keeping busy and doing as a church. It is about being a faithful presence as the church. 
being a faithful presence. Understanding that the word of God has breathed life into us. And now we're alive. We're supposed to act alive. That's why I love that song today. Children running, basically. Children, children, I'm not going to be quiet. Are you? Live your life out loud. That's not simple. But if you do it together, you will live your life out loud. In a world where they are, statistics, all the statistics are showing people are more open right now than they've been in years to things of the Spirit, to things of faith. They're open to this. What are we doing about it? Carol, before you run out, how many do we have in the house this morning? 120. Last week it was 220. So there's 120. Isn't it interesting, though? 120, I think, is who is in the upper room at the day of Pentecost. Oh. So feel Jesus breathe over you. Not me. <sighs> Look, I didn't cough that time. But his breath has been passed on to us for generation after generation after generation. Are we taking this seriously? Because it's not simple. It's hard. It requires us, though, to be intentional. To be amazingly intentional about what we do and what we be. We get so caught up in the verb, we should be in the noun. It should fill us. My friends, it's April of 2024. How did that happen? How did I get so old? But I'm still making noise. And I'm still running around. Let's make this Jesus' playground. It's going to be hard work, but I'm inviting you to join in on this. Stretch yourselves. Push yourselves. And yes, maybe even give a little bit more financially. Don't go selling your houses, though, unless you want to sell it to me for $100,000. I'll take that. <laughs> no, but I want you to think about that. This was not a communist thing that was going on. This was a family, and they were taking care of their own, and people were attracted to that. They were like, wow, what makes them different? I want to be part of that. And they did. They embraced people. They embraced people with strange names because they were Greek. They were Syrian. They were from Cyrene. They embraced people with skin colors that were different from there, including those really pale white dudes from Rome. Think about it. Because this thing came from the Middle East. And it spread like crazy. By the time John is writing, it is all the way around the Mediterranean. It's out toward India. It's down into Af Africa, thanks to an Ethiopian sitting there one day reading a scripture. Friends, I want you to remember this date. It's April 8th, 2024. Tomorrow, the world could end. We had an earthquake the other day. Signs of the time. Well, maybe we're going to get an extra chance. Maybe we're going to give some extra time from Jesus to get this right. Maybe it's time for a reformation. Maybe it's time for a reformation. Maybe it's time for us to become the faithful presence that has the breath of God breathed into them. It's going to be hard work. 
It's going to be hard. But somebody's got to start it. It could be you. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, my Lord and my God, breathe on us with your holy breath and consume us. Give us the peace that it is going to be okay because we're together. Let your church, your whole church, not just in this building, but all across this nation and all across the world, be the breath and the life of God. For as the Father sent the Son, now you send us. That's in the name of the triune God of grace that we pray. Amen. He did this. Not an elder, not a pastor, not people setting this table, although it was set with love. Jesus is responsible for this. And he invites all who believe in him as Lord and God to participate in this table. Not because you're worthy but because he made you worthy. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, this is your table. It's a table that has been set before us for 2,000 years. Simple elements of bread and cup which all of a sudden becomes something so much more important. It gives us continuity with you and all the faithful in time and space. We commune with you and one another. And we've been called to this table. Thank you, Lord, for setting this table for us. Thank you, Lord, for doing what you have done, are doing, and will do for us. Consecrate this sacrament and draw us closer to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Interestingly enough, one of the earliest enemies of the church was a guy who would pen a letter to the Corinthians and say, I give to you what has been passed on to me. For on the night that he was betrayed, after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his friends and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. And remember. And likewise, he took the cup. And he offered to them and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant made with my blood. This is the cup of my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take it, all of you, and drink. And remember. And we still remember, for as often as we break this bread, as often as we take this cup, we proclaim 
salvation from the cross. Forgiveness of sins from the cross. And an empty tomb. And we proclaim it and we will continue to proclaim it until the day in which Jesus returns. And then on that day we will say, it is well with my soul. This is the table of God for the people of God, and now it is ready to go forth to his people. Today the plates will be brought to you, and you will take the bread from the plate. You are asked to contemplate, to embrace your own personal journey with Jesus Christ. When you receive the cup today, we ask you to hold it because, again, you is a plural. And you and I will take it together.
How beautiful it is when family dwells in unity. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, you fed us with your word. You quenched the thirst of our faith. You have breathed into us new life. We are satisfied. Now take us, Lord, and use us for the mighty works of the reconciler of the universe, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Don't forget that there's food next door. And to, um, by the way, to dwell in unity means to leave Pastor Pat at least one deviled egg, okay? Just saying. Because some of us have to clean up things afterward. And we get over there, and I know, they shouldn't be called deviled eggs, by the way. They should be called angel eggs. Because they are incredible. it is when family dwells in unity. Share the breath of Christ with one another and with the world. This is how Christ changes the world. As you go out, you go out with a blessing. Oh, oh, oh that he continues to bless you indeed. May he open up the gates and let it all out using you. Feel his hands poking you, prodding you, embracing you. May he keep you free from the evil one. May, may he keep you free from causing pain and feeling pain. I bless you in the name of the triune God of grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. This is my commandment that you love one another, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another, that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. 
joy may be full. This is 